Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome and welcome back to many of you. My name is Emily coming to you from the New York Presbyterian Hudson Valley Hospital's teaching kitchen. Hello. And we are going to be making homemade doses today. So if you've never had a dosa or you have no idea what it is, I'm very excited to introduce you to this wonderful food that is South Indian originally. Um, although the origins are a little unclear, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. So we're going to be making dosas and we're going to be filling that with aloo gobi, which is a uh, roasted potato and cauliflower dish, um, as well as making our own tomato and mint chutney. So going to be a really uh, flavorful class using lots of spices and herbs and just a few ground rules before we begin with the cooking. If everybody could kindly keep, keep themselves muted throughout the presentation. And if you have questions, feel free to put them into the chat box. And Alita, who is joining us, uh, volunteering to be our moderator today, is going to be reading us your questions. So very, very exciting class. Um, the dosa, as I mentioned, origins are a little unclear um, to some historians. Some think that the dosa originated in Udipi, um, which is a town, um, or Parantaka, which is another town. So there's a little bit of a rivalry of where the dosa came from. Others believe the dosa was already being eaten in ancient Tamil country around 1000 AD. So it's a very ancient recipe. Um, and while the origins are unclear, it has persisted over time to become a really popular and delicious street food um, that you can find in India, usually south of India. So the, there's actually evidence that um, a recipe for the dosa is found in a 12th century Sanskrit encyclopedia, which I think is really cool. Uh, so at least we know that it goes at least that far back. So with that, we're going to go ahead and begin our cooking. So um, as I may have mentioned, the dosa is a fermented batter, and it's sort of like an Indian-style crepe. So this is our dosa batter here, and it's been resting overnight. So hopefully it has had enough time to ferment and get nice and bubbly, right? It looks, it really looks like a crepe. Um, and it's hard to believe that this is actually a mixture of rice and moong dal. So let me show you, this is the moong dal that I used today along with the rice. So this is moong dal, which is split mung beans. And I bought this on Amazon because it is a little hard to find, but I have made this dosa recipe with red lentils, and I'm going to show you how to make that as well, because red lentils you can find anywhere. So this is our mung dal, and then we have our basmati rice. So the mung dal and the basmati rice are the two key ingredients for making your dosa. Um, if you don't have the mung dal, like I mentioned, you can also instead use um, red lentils, and these are just Goya split red lentils, okay? So you have options. This batter that you see that I just showed you, uh, that is made with the moong dal, so you'll see um, the color is really kind of this beige color, which is very characteristic of your dosa. If you make your batter with red lentils, it's going to have a little bit of a pinkish color, so there is a difference in the color but they both taste delicious. All right, so um, I'll get into making the batter a little bit later because I want to start us off with the chutney and the aloo gobi so they have some time to um, cook down. So in your packets, you have a recipe for tomato and mint chutney, and we're going to get started with that first. Um, and then one thing that I did ahead of time for the aloo gobi dish is I roasted our cauliflower and our potatoes. So this is done ahead of time. Everything else we'll be doing from, from the beginning. So let's just start by getting our pan nice and warm over a medium heat. And we're gonna prepare our shallot. Now, 
This is a very big shallot, but uh, you could use a shallot or a red onion or a white onion, whatever you have. I kind of enjoy the shallot in this recipe because it's a little bit sweeter and um, it just brings a nice, a nice kind of flavor to this, to this um, chutney recipe. So I cut off the top and the bottom, just like an onion, same thing. And then I'm gonna make a tunnel and cut right through while the pan gets nice and warm and peel off our papery exterior. So we're just gonna start by slicing up our shallot. Very easy. You could use, if you're not you know, comfortable slicing and dicing your onions, you can always buy onions that are chopped up at the grocery store. That's a nice way to um, make things a little bit faster. So feel free to do that as well. And now I have this nice flat surface. I'm just going to curl my fingers and roll my knife to get some slices. All right. I'm feeling that my knife needs a sharpening, just needing a little bit of resistance. You see that after class. All right, so we're going to start by cooking our shallot. Just a little bit of oil into our pan and in it goes, enough to cover the bottom. And then we have some spices that we're using in this as well. Um, lots of spices actually. One of the things that I love about Indian cuisine is just the amount of spices that are used and how masterfully they're used. So um, there's a lot of different kinds of spices. And it just brings so much flavor into the food that, you know, otherwise could be a little bit bland. But here we have a combination of four spices. So we've got our mustard seeds, so that beige looking one here, our cumin seeds, our red pepper flakes, and our cinnamon sticks. So we're going to be popping all of that in with the shallot and getting some a little bit of heat to kind of help awaken the spices. All right, so this is important whenever you're working with spices, um, they really are kind of activated by heat. So it's best to kind of, you know, get them either in at the start of your cooking, or if you're using ground spices, you don't want, and you don't want to burn them, you can add them in a little bit later as well. But this recipe calls for the whole spices. So everything's just getting, you know, worked down a little bit. You could add a pinch of salt at this stage as well to help kind of draw out the moisture from those onions or rather shallots in this case. And I'm just kind of poking the shallots with my spoon because they're cut in, um, in sort of circles and um, I'm just kind of poking them apart. <laughs> That's it, pretty easy. So for this chutney, we're going to be using canned diced tomatoes. So I have two of these cans right here. And we're going to sweeten it with a little bit of maple syrup. So I have about three tablespoons of maple syrup. And then we're going to finish it off with some fresh mint. So this isn't going to happen until the end. But I'm just going to chop it up now to kind of get it ready. So fresh mint. You don't want to use your stems when you're um, cooking with mint because they're just too tough. Some stems like um, parsley stems and cilantro stems, you know, you can, you can have those stems. They're not really such a problem, except for the really thick ones. But the mint, I prefer not to. So our mint is ob obviously washed before and dried really well. So if it's dried, it's a little bit easier to cut. It's always easier to cut your herbs when they're dry. So this is starting to smell good. Our shallots are beginning to soften. Our spices are, are awakening, becoming very fragrant. And we're ready for our next step. We're gonna add our tomato and our maple syrup. So tomatoes um, can be quite acidic. So it's nice to kind of have that sweetness of the maple syrup to kind of round them out a bit. So this is pretty much done. There's not much else you need to do here. I bet you thought tomato chutney would have been more complicated, right? But that's pretty much it. Um, so with our chutney, we added all those spices, tomatoes, uh, maple syrup, a little salt, and we're going to let this just cook and stew for about 15 minutes or so. So I'm going to move this to the back so it doesn't take up too much space. And then at the end, we're going to add our mint 
and a little bit of uh, freshly grated ginger. So I'm just gonna peel that ginger. You can also peel it using a spoon, like a small teaspoon and just kind of scrape it. I find the peeler does a really good job. So I'm holding the ginger and kind of bracing it with my thumb and pushing, pushing the peeler along. It's just a little bit easier to manage, okay? So we've got our ginger peeled and we're just gonna grate it. Since this is going in with the mint, we're gonna, we can put them together. So this is um, fresh ginger that I'm using here. You can also always freeze your ginger. A lot of people don't realize ginger does really well um, being kept in the freezer. So if you were to do that, you would peel it and then pop it in a little Ziploc bag. And then whenever you wanna use it, you can just pull it right out of the freezer and add it, you know, and grate it just like I'm doing here. So it's a really easy way to preserve your ginger, which sometimes gets a little like a little tired and it gets a little withered and sometimes it turns blue or gets moldy. So we don't want any of that. All right. So we've added our freshly grated ginger and this will all go in uh, in about 15 minutes when the chutney is ready. Do we have any questions about that recipe while I move this to the back? Yes, Chef Emily, there are two questions about substitutions. Um, is there Anita, a I'm so sorry, you're just, you're very quiet. Would you mind just getting a little closer to your microphone there? Could you hear me now? A little bit better. Okay. Um, so I just want to check in with our audience. Can you hear Alita okay? You can put yes in your chat or no if she's too quiet. Alita, give us another test. All right, so I just, you know, um, put the, the volume up a little higher. Is okay, thank you. Yes, okay, perfect. So, Sounds like so that's there, working better. So there are two questions. They're both in terms of substitution. So um, basically, could you substitute the maple syrup? Is there something that could use instead of that? Sure, um, you could use coconut sugar or cane sugar. That's actually more traditional. I'm using the maple syrup to make it a little bit healthier. Um, you could also use honey if you wanted. Or if you wanted to um, just omit the sugar altogether, you could do that too. If you're trying to minimize the amount of sugar that you have, you can take the maple syrup out altogether. It's not going to change the flavor. I mean, it, it does add some sweetness. So, you know, just be aware that it's going to change the flavor a little bit and make it a little less sweet, but it's still going to be good without syrup. And then the, another question is, can you substitute scallions for the onion? Oh yeah, great idea. So definitely you could throw in some scallions um, instead of the onion and, and do that if, you are, uh, if you're avoiding onion for whatever reason, absolutely, scallions would be fine. And the last one here is how long can you freeze ginger? That's a good question. So I've had it in the freezer up to six months, like most frozen fruits and vegetables. I, I usually keep that for about six months to six to nine months depending on how vigilant I am. <laughs> All right, anything else before we so, go to our next recipe? Yes. yes, it says, what do you serve it with? So the tomato and mint chutney is going to be served with our dosa, which is the, um, the centerpiece of the class. Um, you can also have it though, just with you know um, grilled chicken or fish or something like that. Or if you're having like a nice pot of lentils, you can add a scoop of the uh, tomato chutney to that. You can use it in, in different ways to kind of bump up your flavor on a protein. Or even if you were to, you know, roast some veggies and you wanted to bump up the flavor there, toss them in the, ch in the tomato chutney. You know, it's just gonna add that really lovely um, spiced and, and, and complex flavor that the tomatoes are gonna give you. And okay. that's my family. Okay, great. So thank you for your questions, really good ones. Um, so we're gonna go to our next recipe, which is alu gobi. Uh, for this recipe, I start by roasting my cauliflower and potatoes first. Um, some recipes for alu gobi don't require this step and you just put it in with everything else. But I love the way when you roast vegetables, it just increases their sweetness a little bit um, and it makes them, you know, a little crunchy too, so they don't just get soggy. So I like that they kind of will hold their shape and texture in this, um, in this dish. So we roasted that and then in our skillet here, we're gonna get this a little warm. Uh, we're gonna start by adding some oil and our, again, our cumin seed. So very, very characteristic in Indian cuisine. 
And I'm just gonna keep this on a very low heat as, um, as I get the other uh, things ready here because I don't wanna burn our spices. So our cumin seeds are already, you know, they're starting to pop a little bit and get fragrant. And then we're gonna add an um, onion. Keep an eye on those cumin seeds. You don't want them to burn. If they burn, you can just dump them out and start again, it's not a big deal. And then peeling our onion, same thing with the shallot. You can use onion or shallot for this dish or scallions for our scallion friends, if, uh, if you'd like, or leeks would be good too, anything in that family. So just peeling the outside. And we're just gonna chop this up nice and small. This is a little, a small onion. Probably um, once it's chopped up is gonna equate to about half a cup. So we're going across and then across the side. Be careful as you get towards the bottom there because it gets very narrow. I'm just gonna pop these in right away so that it brings the temperature of the pan down. And then we'll do the other one. All right, any other questions so far? Okay. All right, so we've got our onion and our cumin. We're gonna add our turmeric, beautiful, beautiful golden spice full of anti-inflammatory qualities that we love. And everybody talks about turmeric now, you know, in India, they've been talking about it for centuries, <laughs> but here it's all the rage, right? So let's add our golden spice. We've got our cumin seeds. Now this is starting to look a little dry now that I added the turmeric, so I'm just gonna add a little more oil. So what do I mean by that? It's like the turmeric should be sizzling in a little bit of fat. It shouldn't just be dry on the pan. Okay, so now we've got really nice golden spices. And we're gonna put this back on the heat because my pan needs a little more heat now. Chef Emily. All right. Is that yep. um, powdered or fresh turmeric? So I'm using turmeric powder. Um, if you wanted to use fresh turmeric, you certainly could. Um, there's no real uh, benefit to the fresh versus the dry that we know of. So it's, it's a little bit easier to find the powdered turmeric than it is to find the fresh stuff. So I tend to use the powdered. It's just a little easier to find. Um, and then for the ginger here, I do recommend fresh ginger because it does have a very distinct taste, a much, um, you know, a much stronger and kind of brighter flavor than the dry ginger. So we're just going to chop up some ginger and this I already peeled. Um, I did, you know, I have gotten the question, is it better to peel your ginger or do you have to peel it? Um, I do re always recommend peeling ginger because it's just a little bit of a brighter flavor. It's, it's a little bit cleaner in taste and probably in dirt too. <laughs> so I prefer, I do prefer to peel ginger when I'm working with it. So you just want to get a really, really nice small mint in your ginger. So I'm kind of scraping it together, hands on top, and chopping it apart. All right, so I'll pop that in too. And then we're also adding a little bit of chili powder, just about a quarter teaspoon. So let's add that for more spice and flavor. And we're going to add some chickpeas to this. So I'm using canned chickpeas that I drained and I rinsed. So important to drain and rinse your chickpeas. Many of you know that already by now. And let's get everything kind of worked together here. Okay. So you wanna make sure your onion begins to soften a little bit. Your ginger takes on a little bit of that heat as well. Um, and then we're gonna add our, um, our roasted veggies too. So let's add a chickpeas. And just make sure that the spices coat everything really well, right? You want to make sure the chickpeas get all of that good flavor on them. You can add a little salt as well. Now I've salted and um, 
I salted and oiled the roasted vegetables. So just keep that in mind if that's gonna get added in here that we don't want things to be too salty. So just um, keep an eye on, on your salt levels. All right, and then this is gonna get a few things on top. We're gonna add some cilantro. So I'm just gonna whack off the bottom of the stems and I'm gonna leave the rest of the stems. So again, um, cutting your herbs when they're dried, dried very, very well, makes it a lot easier to cut them. And cilantro has wonderful detoxifying qualities um, and chelating qualities. So it can actually um, help to extract heavy metals that we may accumulate from eating tuna and things like that. It can actually help to extract heavy metals. So it's a really powerful little herb. All right, let's put our roasted veggies in here. So you can notice I have my parchment paper down and this is, this is now cooled down, but you can put it in when it's still hot. Um, but this is really useful, you know, the parchment paper. I kind of pull everything to the center and then I hold two ends together and these two ends together and it just makes it easy to kind of slide everything in and then you can just discard your, your paper. It takes a little practice, but um, the first few times I tried to do that, the parchment paper would just rip and it didn't work so well. So just it's kind of balancing the weight of the, uh, of the vegetables. All right, any questions about that? Yes, there's a couple of questions. Um, sure. What is the ratio of fresh turmeric to, to powder and the same thing, fresh ginger to powder ginger? That's a really good question. So I don't use fresh turmeric that much, but I would say it's basically when you're going from something that's fresh to dried, the dried is more concentrated than the fresh. So you usually, as a rule of thumb, need about twice as much fresh to dried. Um, so that's sort of how I think about it. Uh, so it's probably be, be the same for, um, for ginger and turmeric as well. So if you're using one teaspoon of turmeric, you probably want two teaspoons of fresh turmeric. Um, there's a question regarding the beans. Do you have to dry them after rinsing? No, you don't need to, not for this dish. Yeah, good question. For the garbanzo beans, just Rinse them really well under some fresh water and you can toss them in. And then there's a question about why there's no garam masala in this dish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so great question. Uh, so garam masala is, first of all, a masala is a mix of spices. So you can have different kinds of masalas. Um, and there's one particular mix of spices that's called garam masala, very traditional in Alu Gobi. Um, and it is a little hard to find. So that's why today I, I tried to create an Alu Gobi that anybody could make um, using, you know, household spices that are easy to find. But yes, you could use the garam masala if you wanted to. No more questions, but a comment from Denise that the, the, <laughs> Great. the parchment paper right. is, a, is one of the best tips she's ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> parchment paper is a lifesaver. It's true. It's much better for the planet than aluminum. And since today is Earth Day, it's worth mentioning to uh, everybody. If everybody just converted to parchment paper, I'm sure there are some drawbacks to parchment paper too, but uh, it's definitely a step forward. So we're going to add some fresh lime juice. So I'm just squeezing this right into the pan. You can always grab your tongs, squeeze them together and use them, put them inside to twist. Really helps to get all the juice out. We're adding lots and lots of fresh lime juice, fresh cilantro, all that good stuff is going in. All right, so we can even, I just added half, I'm gonna add another one. That one wasn't very good. It's not bossy. All right. Yeah, right now. You know, and I'm just going to remind everybody to keep their microphones on mute. I'm just noticing a little background noise there. Not to worry. It happens to everyone once in a while. Okay. So we're going to toss all this together. This is pretty much done. We've got our lime juice. We've got our cauliflower, our potatoes, our chickpeas, right? And this is going to be our filling for the dosa with a little tomato chutney on top, it's gonna be really nice. All right, let's pop our cilantro. 
mix it all together and we'll just keep this warm in the back while we work on making our dosa, the star of our show. Okay. So I'm just gonna show you a little close up of what this is looking like. So you know, the pan is fairly dry, right? So you can see it's golden, the cauliflower is nice and toasted. The lime juice is gonna give it a nice pop of um, flavor. And we can start getting our dosa ready. So I'm gonna just get my cast iron pan really hot. And this is important, you do want a very hot pan. And I'll just keep these kind of simmering back here. Our tomato chutney looks good. It starts sort of um, getting a little thicker. I'll bring this forward so you guys can see the end result once it's ready. You can serve this um, chutney chunky or you can pick the cinnamon sticks out and blend it if you want a smooth, kind of more of a smooth sauce. So you've got options. Okay, any questions about any of that? Um, no, Chef Emily, no questions, but um, okay. it says Thanks. that it's somebody named Jane. She says she was born in South India and she yeah. loves roses, but she had never learned how to make them. So she's thanking you. Um, Hi, Jane. <laughs> Jane is a dear friend. Jane, I'm so glad you're here and I hope that you will try to make doses at home. If not, come over and I'll make them for you. <laughs> All right, so we have our dosa batter that has been fermented overnight. And the way that I got to this stage, I'm gonna show you that now, is I started off by soaking the lentils or the mung dal, whichever you're using, and water for three hours. So this is step one. So this is all written out in your packet for your, under your dosa batter page. So step one, in a bowl, combining your lentils, rice, and if you can find it, fenugreek seeds. I couldn't find it at the local grocery store. So if you can, that's gonna, it's not gonna impact the flavor of the dosa, but it is gonna impact the look of the dosa. So fenugreek helps it get really kind of golden. Um, so what I, I like to add instead is a little sprinkle of turmeric, which also helps it to look golden, but it's not traditional to add the turmeric. It's more traditional to add um, the fenugreek. So after you've soaked your lentils and your rice together for four hours, you can strain it. And this is just a half recipe. So I did half a cup of rice and half a cup of lentils, right? And, um, and I just combine them and let them soak. These ones have been soaking for four hours. Do we have any questions, Alita? Let me see here. Um, oh, I saw something. Yeah, it's just saying that they, um, where people find fenugreek seeds. Um, when yeah, they are hard to find. You can order them online, um, but I didn't, I'm not using them today because I couldn't find them locally. So if I can't find them locally, I try to, you know, only use ingredients that you guys can find easily. So don't worry about the fenugreek. This is just the, uh, the rice and the lentils. Rice and red lentils. Very important to use red lentils and not another kind of lentil. Um, and again, as I mentioned at the start, you can also use mung dal, but because I couldn't find this locally, we're using the red lentils. So either one will work. I've tested them both. So we have our soaked for four hours. You could soak them for longer too. If you wanna soak them for 12, go ahead. You can soak them for up to 12 hours. You soak them and then you add some water and it is very useful to have a high speed blender for this. So if you don't have a high speed blender, you can use a food processor. But the essential thing is you want to try to create a dough, like a, a batter that's very, very smooth, where you can't even tell that there's lentils in there. So we're going to start this off. And we may need to add a little more water, but I did the measurements that are in your pockets, so it should be good. So I'm going to start it on low, and then I'll just bring it up a little bit. The cast iron is getting nice and warm. Thank <laughs> you. 
So dosa is not a complicated food. It's really only a few ingredients, um, but it does take time because you need to allow the batter to ferment. So I just want to show you after you've blended your basmati rice and lentils, this is what it looks like. So you can see the color. I don't know if you can. It's a little bit like more of a coral pink color. Okay, and it's very, very thin. Now, if you don't have a really good blender or you don't have a really good food processor, what you can do is blend it the, as best you can and then hold a strainer and pour the batter so that it comes through and it, you don't get um, any pieces of rice or lentils that have, you know, have, are kind of left behind. Oops, just no, there we go. Okay, so this is your batter. You're done. At this point, you just wait. So what you would do is you would get a clean kitchen towel and you would put it over the bowl. Um, you could also add salt. Salt can help with the fermentation process as long as it's not iodized salt. Iodine will inhibit fermentation, so you don't wanna add that. So now you just cover it with a little towel and you set it in a spot in your kitchen. It doesn't have to be a particularly warm spot, but it helps if it's a little bit warmer, it kind of aids the fermentation. And then this is now, um, this, this one I made yesterday, I blended it yesterday, and now it's been almost, you know, a little over 12 hours, uh, a little over almost 24 hours. So it's ready. So once it's fermented, so we just went from step, if you're following along from step three to step four. So it's a, it was a little, it's got like a little bubbles on the surface. I'm gonna add a little bit of turmeric to make it golden, but you don't have to just to kind of get the color, the dosa color. And this is ready to go in the pan. So our pan is really hot. <laughs> it's actually starting to smoke a little bit. So I'm just gonna let that, don't want it so hot, but you do want it hot. We're gonna add some oil. You can also use ghee. Ghee is very traditional when you're cooking Indian food. It's clarified butter. Um, so you can use ghee to cook your dosa if you want. I'm gonna use avocado oil. So any oil that's good for high heat, okay? And traditionally, a dosa pan is not a cast iron skillet like this. Um, dosa pans are, have a very, very low edge. So it's very easy to kind of get your spatula under it and flip it. Um, so we're gonna make do with our cast iron because this is what we have and what most people have here. So we'll start with our oil. And you just want to make sure that it is really well distributed all around the pan, completely covered. And we're going to add our dosa batter. So I'm going to add one scoop right into the middle. And I'm going to use the back of my ladle, kind of like a pizza, to just gently push it to the sides. You can also use the French technique to kind of like move the batter this way. I, I kind of, I'm used to the French technique. <laughs> this one works for me. And I'm just gonna bring the heat back under this. And you just wanna cook it. I'm just gonna show you, right? You wanna cook it until, so it's one smooth layer. And you wanna cook it until the, um, the dosa is golden on both, si on both sides. Some people only cook dosa to be golden on one side, but I like to get the browning on both sides. So you've got to have your flipper spatula ready. Get your plate ready. Okay, let's finish up our um, tomato chutney. So we're going to add the mint and the, um, the shredded, or I guess grated ginger. Let's add that in. Because I want it to, you know, be there in the last few minutes of cooking so that the mint stays bright because it's fresh and the ginger gets a little bit of heat. Okay, so now this is starting to get just a little golden. I can start to coax my spatula underneath. 
And we can go ahead and flip it. Beautiful. That's it. This is our dosa. This is pretty much done. I'm going to show you in a minute how beautiful and golden it is. Um, it's got some really nice, like a really nice smell, a little bit of that like nice fermented, um, it's going to have that nice fermented taste, which almost makes it taste cheesy. It's kind of amazing. Okay. And I'm just hearing a little bit of reverberation in the background. I'm just going to check everybody's microphones. Yeah, I see my headphones. Sorry? I sent the person a note. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Maybe someone has a little construction going on. Yeah. Thanks, I got it. All right, perfect. So our dosa is now, now done. It's golden on both sides. You can lift it out of the pan. And I'll show you, this is our dosa. This is the final result. So it's nice and golden all around. The other side is cooked. There's no, um, there's no raw batter showing, right? And just make sure there's like a little tiny piece that's stuck here to the bottom. So I'm just gonna scrape that out before I do the next one, right? Because you don't want your batter to get stuck um, to, the, to the dosa. I mean, sorry, to the, um, you don't want your batter to get stuck to the previous dosa, it'll get stuck to the pan. So I'll do one more. Pour one ladle full in. Use the ladle and the French. This is like a French and Italian technique, right? <laughs> Using the back of your ladle like a pizza. And if there are any holes, you can just fill it in with a little batter. That's fine too. And now we're going to fill this with our alu gobi. Okay. Our tomato chutney, which is now very thick. I promised I would show you that. So I'm just going to show you. It's all of the juices from the canned tomato have reduced. So it's now just this really nice kind of thick chutney. Hold on. Okay. So this is our tomato chutney, right? So I actually like to use the back of the spoon to kind of, I used um, chopped tomatoes. So I kind of smush the back, you know, like to smush it to get it. I still like it chunky, but I don't like it completely, um, like with really big chunks. So I just am doing a little smushing here. All right. So here's your dosa with your fillings. Often a dosa will be served either open or closed, like a little omelet. And that's it. This is our class. Every recipe we have completed. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about spices, the spices that we're make, we use today, but I also want to take questions if there are any. Yeah, there, there's a few. So um, for okay. us to know, could you um, enjoy this dish without the doza? Oh my gosh, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> So Phyllis, uh, one of the reasons that I wanted to teach the dosa as well as the alu gobi and the tomato chutney is because alu gobi and tomato chutney are both really good on their own. So if you didn't feel like maybe you don't have a good blender or you didn't feel like fermenting the batter and going through that whole step of making the dosa itself, absolutely, you could still make the alu gobi and have it as a delicious uh, vegetable side and enjoy the tomato chutney in the way that um, I mentioned earlier, you know, with some different proteins. Yeah. Thank you, Phyllis. Um, there's a, a question from Barbara. Do red lentils have different taste or nutrition from yellow or green? So Barbara, good question. So red lentils um, are still very high in protein, very high in fiber. Um, on a macronutrient level, they're very similar. They're very, very similar. But when you get to micronutrients, um, all lentils, all beans have slightly different types of fiber, very, very micro types of differences. And these differences can feed different kinds of bacteria in your gut, the good bacteria. So um, whether you're eating red lentils or green lentils or, or brown lentils or black beluga lentils, all of those lentils um, 
are beneficial for your gut and contain fiber and protein. So they're very similar on the macronutrients, but it's good to have some variety and not always eat the same kinds of lentils. For this recipe though, and I emphasize this again, it's very important to use the red lentils because they're split, right? Which is why red lentils only cook in 15 minutes and brown and black and green lentils, you know, because they're not, they're not split. I have a I have a glare today, <laughs> all right, because they're not split like this, they are a lot thicker and it takes a, a longer time for them to soak and break down. So make sure you use either the split red lentils or if you wanna go really authentic and find the split mung dal, you can also buy this online. Any other questions? Yes, Chef Emily, this one I had to look up because I didn't know what it was. So it <laughs> says, does the doza have a similar taste to, I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce this correctly, Malawak, M-A-L-A-W-A-C-H, which is a Gemini pancake? That's a really good question. I have never made Malawak, so I do not know. But now you've piqued my curiosity. I want to go and find a recipe for Malawak. That sounds really fun. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah. And there is... Um, I'm, I'm sorry, it's Gail. It's pronounced Malawak. Malawak. So, Malawak. yeah, it's Middle Eastern. Yeah, it's Middle Eastern. You can actually buy it at ShopRite in the kosher freezer section. Wow. I, I forgot the brand suddenly, but I think it's Tam, T-T-A-A-M-T-I. It's, it Thank looks so very similar, that. but it's made a little differently. So I was just wondering. Do you know if it's made with um, with a bean and a rice or is it different? No, no, it's not. Okay. So I wonder if it, it's like a, a similar, not, not maybe not so much taste then, but it's like maybe a very similar consistency, I think. So interesting. It, looking at it. Yeah. It looks a lot Thank like you. It. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, yes. Beautiful. <laughs> But thank you, this thank is a great recipe, sharing. regardless. I love all the vegetables. <laughs> thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you for watching. Thank you, oh, thank sure. you, everybody. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> and oh, then there well, it's so nice to have you all. And um, we just, do we have any more questions? Because we just have a few minutes left. I, no questions, but there is a, a resource of a grocery in Wappingers off Route 9. Um, is yeah, it Sarawati. Yes, that's the one, Sarawati. Yeah. Sarawati. <laughs> uh, otherwise, um, everybody's saying great class. Thank you so much. And just a brief note on spices before we close. We use cumin, mustard seed, cinnamon, turmeric. So you can see all of these spices are really contributing to flavor. Um, but cumin in particular, uh, the claimed benefits related to cumin are relating to aiding digestion, um, immune health, and circulation. Um, there's two types of antioxidants, api, Apigenin, I think is how you say it, and luteolin, which are, um, are helpful for digestion and immune health. And then the mustard seeds that we use today, we use regular yellow mustard seeds, um, which you can find, but the traditional way is to use brown mustard seeds. Mustard seeds also contain antioxidants. They're a very good source of glucosinate glucosinolates, uh, which are a group of, basically they're a group of sulfur containing antioxidants and compounds that are found in cruciferous vegetables. And they're very, very high in mustard. Um, and they may help to prevent cancer cells from growing and spreading. So mustard is really awesome. Um, it also may help to uh, lower blood sugar levels. So mustard has some, some potential properties yeah, there. And then the last thing I wanted oh, sure. to mention um, is about I cinnamon. Hold on, I think yeah, I just, hello, I'm here. One yeah, more person yeah, on uh, forgot to mute themselves. Open, which is open Oops, sorry, Pam, I'm going to mute you. <laughs> and then the cinnamon, the last, um, last spice I really want to mention is uh, most cinnamon are, is of the cassia variety. Um, Ceylon is known as true cinnamon, and that's the one that has higher concentrations of these comp these powerful compounds. So if you can try to buy cinnamon um, that is Ceylon, it it's, has stronger qualities than the cassia variety. It's high in cinnamaldehyde, which it has these anti-inflammatory properties and antioxidant qualities. 
And then cinnamon may also improve some key risk factors of heart disease. So cinnamon is very good for our heart, um, including things like um, to help manage cholesterol, triglycerides, uh, blood pressure. So it's a good thing to add to your food and it tastes really good too. Um, it's also been shown to reduce insulin resistance. So if you are uh, insulin resistant, cinnamon may help to support you. And of course, as I always say, check with your doctor before, you know, taking a turmeric supplement or taking a cinnamon supplement or anything like that. Check with your doctor about whether these um, spices are okay for you and your health condition. And happy dosa day. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We have more classes coming up in May. Um, even tomorrow, we have a class on healthy snacks and mealtime tips for, um, for specifically for Autism Awareness Month. So that's going to be a great class tomorrow. And then next week, we have three programs. Let me see if I can remember them. We're doing a savory class all about eggs. We're featuring a physician, Dr. Trapasso, and we're going to be talking about springing into health since spring is upon us. And then I have one more class, ah, heart healthy cooking with nuts. So we're going to be using nuts and seeds and making some really um, delicious heart healthy foods. Uh, so as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you to Alita for her wonderful moderating. And I hope to see you um, very soon enjoying doses of your own. <laughs> thank you.